Okay, so now in the book, you go through uh, your whole story of how you started your company. And, and by the way, Kevin was a shuffleboard shark in university. Well, not shark, a hustler. You were a hustler. I put myself through the last two years of Waterloo uh, with shuffleboard with a guy named Paul Chaput. We never lost. But you took advantage of, you, you, you did the hustle, right? You made like you weren't that good until your opponent had a few no. drinks. And then suddenly, man, you were scoring it. Well, this was one of my first partnerships that was extremely profitable. And I learned that, you know, if you have different attributes, and Paul had a, the ability, if those of you who know how to play shuffleboard, he could hang every shot. In other words, if you can hang a shot off the corner, that's worth five points. You only have to do three of those and you won the game no matter what happens. He had a unique attribute to do that, but he'd hold that shot back, hold it back, hold it back until it was time to kill the competition. Then he would send it out there and they'd get slaughtered. So the two of us, put, he went through engineering that way and I went through just fooling around in university. It was fantastic. But it taught me about partnerships. You have to trust your partner. And we what, actually, did you, what did you bring to the partnership? I he, say, could, he could hang the shot. What was it you Paul could do? Paul wasn't that, he wasn't that really a social guy. He couldn't even ask people to play. Oh, so you brought the charm. I just brought the, I was the marketing guy. I would go up to the drunk engineer and say, would you like to play some shuffleboard? Oh, okay. And this is my partner, Paul. He's the mute. <laughs> that is it. All right, so now your first company, though, was in television production. Yes, it was. It was special event television. Again, a partnership with a fellow named Dave Toms, who's still a writer. In fact, he's writing for um, The Blades show. Oh, yeah, yeah, Battle of the Blades. Battle yeah. of the Blades, he's the lead writer, I think, on it. He's always been involved with hockey. And uh, uh, Scott McKenzie, who's now legendary in the film business, and, and myself, we created the format Don Cherry's Grapevine, which became very popular. We shot right. that in Hamilton. And we ended up selling it two years in, and that was the first time I actually turned nothing into money. And it was a pretty interesting experience because we sold it for quite a bit of money. It was the, the beginning of you know, deploying that capital into the new software business. You mean you sold the format of Don Cherry's show? Sold the whole company, because we owned Bobby Orr and the Hockey Legend, um, Don, Don Cherry's Grapevine, the original six, and some other stuff that wasn't working. You know, you have a portfolio of different shows. Some worked, some didn't. So you're buddies with Don? Well, you know, I worked with him for almost three years, and I got to know him pretty well. He's a very quiet guy, lives in Oakville, and he's much different on TV than he is in person. But he taught me something very important. If you're going to spend time making television, make television that people watch. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and all the people you're working with. So I think you have to bring it. When you go on to television, you've got to be, bring your A game and make it interesting so that people want to watch it. Be entertaining. Why are you there? Do you think he influenced you at all in terms of... Uh being controversial, bombastic, perhaps? You know, I think you learn from the input in your environment, so that's why I bring it up in the book. I probably learned something from him. He was great. I used to watch him make TV, and he was right in front of me. And he would, I remember one day, uh, I think it was, I can't remember what goalie it was in the league. We had him on the next night after he'd led in seven goals. And he came on the set and blew the dog, barked at him, you know, that dog that he's yeah. got. And everybody was clapping. And he sat down, and Don looked at him, and he said, you suck. <laughs> it was really an interesting moment. He said, what do you mean, Don? You let in seven goals. Every low shot last night, you let in. If you were on my team, I'd fire you. Gee, I that thought, sounds familiar, Ken. Yeah, it does. And I'm thinking that somehow <laughs> I got assimilated into that. <laughs> I think maybe you did. OK, so then, but after the television production company, you got started on SoftKey. Right. So remind people what SoftKey turned into. SoftKey Software Products was started in the basement of 411 Shaw Street. It was the, effectively the early days of the learning company. We were a consumer software company. I had a thesis that uh, software would eventually, you know, lower itself. In the beginning, we were selling the stuff for $300 a, a copy. But my thesis was the price of computers would come down and that this would become a consumer product. And I'd worked in consumer products before. I'd sold Miss Mute Cat Food. And I thought that maybe I could apply those talents to the software business, and it, it ended up working. We went from zero in sales to nearly a billion when we sold the company. And it was the same idea from the first day. My first partner was John Freeman. In fact, uh, he still has his 50 shares. And that company grew from basically a classic basement story. But there was so much, you know, I think about the journey, all the people and the partners and, and the companies we worked with and the individual that came and went. It, it was 
there were hundreds and hundreds. And finally, we had almost 4,000 employees. I knew them all, and I hired and fired all of them yeah. individually. Well, speaking of firing, this is, I guess, as I read the book, I was thinking there seemed to be a bit of a contradiction in your persona <coughs> and who you are sort of behind the scenes. Because, you know, just as you are on the show, when you talk about building the company, you know, you were very ruthless in a sense. I mean, you were focused, you knew what you needed to do, you made tough decisions. You know, when you went to Walmart and they wanted a really low price, you were like, yes, I can do that. And you made everybody do that. And you said you walked through the office looking at people saying like, who do we really need here? Like people are costs and we got to whack some people. So like there's this very, you know, hard ass side of you. But then on the other hand, all the way through the book, so many times you are so grateful to people, you know, like from the woman who helped you with dyslexia to of course your, your mom and your stepdad and your partners, you, you know, lavishing praise on your partners, how great they are. And, you know, in some ways you start to come across as actually a pretty good guy. It must be true. Well, no, <laughs> this is what I wondered. Like who is the real Kevin, the sweetheart or the heartless bastard? I think, I, I, think, I think you have to be both. Because let, let, me, let me say why that, that's not uh, inconsistent and that these can be, you know, that can happen together. Think about a business if you're an employee there and you're working hard and you're creating wealth for the shareholders and it's working, the company's growing. What you concern yourself with is stability of your job, stability of your paycheck and making sure that you can provide for your family. If somebody's in a business and it's not working, just like if you have a disease in your body, you've got to get surgery and have it removed so that the rest of the body doesn't die. It's that simple, that's the way I look at it. So when I'm, when I'm taking somebody out of the mix I'm, and I'm, I'm removing them from my company, it's because I'm doing it for the rest of the employees that are staying. And I, I really believe that because you've got to fight when times are tough to maintain stability and profitability and economic viability of a business because many people that remain and work there are relying on you. They're trusting you as the company's leader to make sure they're safe. Now, if you have to take out 5% or 10% of the employees or even 15% in economic downturn, it's still the right thing to do because there's 85% that are supporting their families on the paycheck. So I have no remorse. I have no trouble doing it. It's keeping the overall entity Right. viable. You're doing it for the sake of the others. Exactly. And that's a good thing to do. And I think I'm looking at that from the employee perspective, but I'm also worried about my shareholders because without capital, there is no business. Access to capital is how you grow companies. The only reason people put money in your hands is because they trust you to have it multiply. I find it very strange when people say to me, what about society? What about taking care of the baby whales? What about saving, you know, the birch trees? I say, listen, the first thing you have to do with a business is understand its DNA is to profit. Then you take your portion of the profits that you own because you're a shareholder and you save baby whales and you save birch trees or you do whatever you want with it because it's your money. But the business doesn't do that. The business makes money for its shareholders. And by the way, as you listen to this, would you invest in a company that I was running when you hear that? How many would invest with me? Thank you. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. You, when you did your deal with Mattel, you obviously made a lot of money. Now, some people might have said, hey, I've done really great here, and I'm just going to chill out and retire and take it easy. But you are absolutely driven. I mean, I was telling them earlier, four shows, you're running the mutual fund. Plus, you do like a hit with Heather Hiscox every morning on the news network on the morning show. It's like you are driven to go, 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 achieve whatever. What is that? I just want you to know that hit in the morning, I have no pants on. <laughs> oh. He it's tells me that every time I it's mention true, it. true, because I do it by <laughs> Skype. I, I roll out of bed at 648 and I go right back to bed when it's over. Yeah, but why? Why are you so compelled to just, like, you? sometimes you, I mean, you show up at Lang and O'Leary sometimes and you'll go, oh, I'm really really tired, really crispy, <laughs> you know, it's, well, why don't you just take a break? I, tr I tried it. I, I retired for three years. I was forced retirement. I was paid by Mattel $5 million not to work for 36 months. And I thought that was going to be the best time of my life. 
it was the worst. I went to every beach on earth, went to every resort, went anywhere I wanted to go, and I was bored out of my mind. You know, I like being in business. I like working with, with young people. I like doing television and running the mutual funds and starting new companies. I like it. I think, I, think it's, I think it keeps you alive. I think it keeps you stimulated and keeps you young. And I enjoy myself. You know, I don't have to do anything. That's my whole point. I want many Canadians to find themselves in my situation. That's why I wrote this book. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to provide a roadmap for anybody that wants to be a great employee or employer or just enjoy their lives, that the pursuit of freedom is a fantastic thing. I mean, the fact that I don't have to do anything makes me want to do everything. That's the way I look at it. It's interesting because your whole investing philosophy came from your mom. Yes, she was right. You know, the, tr the, the, the cold hard truth about investing is women are smarter than men. I'm not kidding. I think about what she said to me when I was five years old. I didn't even know what she was talking about. She said, Kevin, never spend the principal, just the interest. I know what she was talking about. She said, I only invest in stocks and bonds that pay interest and dividends. I never, ever, ever, ever buy anything that doesn't send me a check every quarter because I have no assurances that it's going to go up in value, but I know I'm getting my dividend check. So if you think about the markets in the last decade, even 12 years now, they have not gone up at all. Zero capital gain in the Dow, in the TSX, in the S&P, zero in 12 years. If you had been my mother during that period, which I have been, you at least have made 6 to 8% in dividend and interest during that whole period of time. So I tell my guys, and we founded O'Leary Funds on that principle. I couldn't find a money manager in this whole country when I tell them that story about my mother, because she'd always say to me, Every week, never, never spend the principal, just the interest. I'd tell them that story, and they'd say, oh, how cute. Don't worry, we'll try and manage that way. But they wouldn't do it. They'd buy me stocks that didn't pay dividends. It'd drive me crazy. So I said, I'll find this, I'll, find the, I'll set the company up myself. I have enough money to do that. I'll hire people. I'll tell them the story. And if they ever, ever, ever buy a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, I'll fire them. Because they work for me. Now I have 50 people working on this. And we thought we'd raise maybe 50, 60 million dollars. We've raised a billion nine, 1.9 billion dollars. I'm not proud of that. I'm proud of my mother's philosophy, which it turns out thousands of Canadians also want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think it's great. Now, I know your stepfather, George, uh, you still have a really strong, you just saw him recently, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're really, really close with him, always have been, he's been a mentor. Um, your mom is gone now, yes. unfortunately. What do you think she would have thought about this book? The fact that her son is a published author. Well, you know, George was a phenomenal resource in doing this because either I thought the past was too painful, I didn't want to dwell in it. He forced me to get the facts of my early childhood right because he was there. And, you know, I went through those chapters with him. It was really hard. And I'm sure he read every word and he'd always... You know, this thing I thought it was going to take me three months to write. It took me a year and a half to get this done. And I worked with lots of people on it. It's hard to write a book because you have to get it right. It's public record. What you put in there has to be correct. And also, you know, I think about making sure, and he would constantly read the chapters. I remember fin finishing a chapter at 11 o'clock, reading it and saying, that's great. Waking up in the morning after Heather's hit in the morning on, on, on you know, CBC, and I'd read it again and say, this is crap. What happened overnight? And it, you constantly rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Look, I hope people enjoy it because I worked so damn hard on it. I look at it this way. If a man could give birth, it would be to a book. <laughs> <laughs> that hard. Uh, I don't know about that. All right. Well, we're going to have uh, questions from the audience as well. And I think if they've got a microphone here, if people want to step up while we're waiting. Eat the question if they yell it out. Yeah, I guess we could do that, but we've got people who are ready to go here, Kevin. All right, who's got a question? Yes, Amanda Lang has 300 pairs of shoes. Mm -hmm. Size six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shoot, go ahead. Hi, my name's Carrie Ann Thomas. I'm a recent entrepreneur of a media company, and I've been attending a few of the Mars seminars. And my interest with you today, because your name has come up at a lot of the investment seminars I've gone to, how do you reach out to investors presenting your business plan in a way that they would want to take you seriously? That's a very good question. You know, let me give you some really interesting information because I've become a student 
of all of the deals that were successful in six years on Dragon's Den and three years on Shark Tank. And let me give you the three attributes that every single one that got financed had. Every, not some, 100%. So, here it is. 100% of the time, when a deal got financed, the entrepreneur or the entrepreneurs, because sometimes there were two or three people there, were able to articulate the idea in 90 seconds or less. It was so pure and crystal clear that they could explain it to me as an investor in 90 seconds, that it would go off like a light bulb in my head. I get it, and I understand how I can make money off that. That was in 100% of the cases. If you go back and look at the tape of all the successful pitches, they always get it out in 90 seconds or less. Sometimes it's 30 seconds. Secondly, they're able to articulate, and it takes them about five minutes, why they're the right person to execute the business plan, why they know how to make this company grow and how to build it and how to make it work. That's number two. And when those two come together, something magical happens. I've been in the room many times and watched it. It's, it's like they start to sizzle like an isotope, and you want to write them a check. They become a leader in your eyes, somebody that has the potential to be successful. And that's what happens when you're able to communicate effectively. So I say to everybody that wants to pitch an idea, and I do this, I practice too. I get in front of the mirror today when I'm pitching a new idea to my investors, and I want to make sure that I can explain it to them in 90 seconds or less. Sizzling. And I try and sizzle like an isotope every day. Okay, all right, and the, and the, and the heels. Thank you so much. Hi, my name's Hillary. I'm just wondering. <laughs> Yeah, you said there were three things that they all had in common. Well, the, the third thing was that the two <laughs> turned them into leaders, the idea that they became something more than the sum of the parts. You, you feel it happen in a room. It's a magical experience. It, it's an aura. It's the patina of success. It's the karma. It's the hidden secret sauce. That's the third thing. Yes? You can take this personally or not, but what would you do with second-generation money? You know, I think of your own son, but you, Pete, you thrive in making the money. You've had the enjoyment. And then would you, you know, give a lot of seed money to your kid? Would you not? That's but, the so best if you inherit money. money, what do you do? I, I, I really think that it's so important if you are lucky enough to have the right genes to end up being born rich, which is, believe me, a wonderful outcome. I have nothing against that. That you understand that you didn't make that money. And that some of the skill sets... If, that are required to maintain it, you may not have. Because when you make your own money, you're scared out of your mind to lose it. That's what happens. I fear losing my money. I sweat bullets every day. I sweat every investment decision I make, trying to protect my principal. And what I find often is missing in the DNA of people that are just given money is they don't get that. And very often, if you go back and you look at great family fortunes, and here's some bad news. It only takes three generations to wipe it out. Shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves in three generations, they say, right? It's, it's awful. It, it means that if you do, don't understand the value of that capital and how hard it was to make it, you tend to lose it. And the way to see, there's a very, very simple way that I'll give you now that's free, uh, that, that will save you. Diversification of investment is crucial. So when your family is approached to re invest in a restaurant or some crazy idea, you always say no to that. Because that's often what happens. Never ever put more than 5% of your money you've inherited into any one stock or business venture. Never, under any circumstance, ever more than 5%. And never more than 20% in any sector, like energy. So if you keep that rule of diversification, there's 10 different sectors in the stock market. So energy is one of them. Biotech's another, for example. So never more than 5% in one stock, and never, never more than 20% in one sector. My rule is 2.5% in one stock. And so when the markets roil, and they go up and down, and they explode on 1,000 points down, you never get wiped out, because not every stock or bond goes down the same, and diversification saves you. And finally, get a good financial manager, because that's the rules they do, even though you have to pay them. 50 basis points, which is half a percent, or even one and a half percent, it's still worth it if you can't do it yourself. But sadly, over and over again, I see this happen. People lose the wealth they've been given. It's tragic. You know, money is so hard to make, and it's a crime. You should go to jail for it if you lose it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Kevin. Uh, my name is Dave. Just a question for you. 
many successful entrepreneurs have had to make a lot of sacrifices, say, along the way to achieve uh, success. Are there sacrifices you've had to make that you wish you didn't have to? Um, that's a great question. And, I, and I'll, let me answer it with an anecdotal story from a few weeks ago at Ryerson. I was um, giving a presentation to a class of about 140 young entrepreneurs. And one fellow got up afterwards and he said to me, listen, I'm having a huge problem. Um, I've been living with this girl that I really love, and she, we, we anticipate getting engaged, and I'm hoping to marry her. But I'm running this business that's been successful. It's in its second year. My sales have now hit $5 million. I work 24-7. I have to. And I just don't get home until midnight, and I go to work on weekends, too. I work every day. And she said to me a week ago that if I don't change this, if I don't put more balance in my life, she's going to leave me. And I said... Who cares? <laughs> it's so hard to get a business as successful as yours, and it's so easy to get another girlfriend. <laughs> oh. You are such a romantic. Just think about this. Because clearly, I, I, I hope I didn't cause any discord in that relationship, but I, I look <laughs> you at it ended this way. It. She's the wrong girl. This guy's a winner. He's a winner. Who, who wouldn't want to hang with him during his journey to success? So, so you would have left the girl, too? Oh, yeah. Oh. Like, we're talking about business here, buddy. You're trying to find your way to freedom. Freedom is getting wealthy. Once you're free, you can do anything you like. So his pitch should have been, look, honey, here's the plan. It's going to take me three more years to make this work. And when I sell it, we, collectively, are going to be rich. And you can do whatever you like. So hang in with me. And if she says no, you know what to do. <laughs> you don't want to talk about sacrifices you personally have made? Well, of course made. I've made sacrifices. You miss time with your kids. Yes, look, there's no question. That the downside is I really believe that there's no balance when you're an entrepreneur. You've got to focus 110%. But you're doing it for a very noble cause. You're doing it so that you can be free. Who doesn't want that? I'm not sure I'd change anything in my life. Look, I've given lots of sacrifices. Thank you for that question. It's a tough one to answer. Hi, my name is Sandra Mitchell, and my question is, if you had a business where your salespeople had guaranteed access to their customers three to five days a week, and were willing and able to provide a product that they appreciated and made a difference not only to them personally, but to their community, but you made a profit on it, but it was a public company. How would you maximize the connection that your salespeople have with your customers? Especially if they have an entrepreneurial nature and would appreciate being rewarded for making a difference for their customers, which they will be doing one-to-one, -one, the only contact person that they have sometime within the next year in the GTA. Are you from this planet? I am. <laughs> I, I'm just, look, I think you, you sound like you've got a pretty utopian situation there. I mean, if customers really have unlimited access, and my, or my, my salespeople have unlimited access to, to my customers, that's a beautiful situation. That sounds like a good business. I don't know what it is, but it sounds like I'd like to invest in it. Because it's really hard. I mean, you know, yeah. salespeople are competing with other salespeople to get time to the customers. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but um, maybe we can talk about over a drink or something. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I am a one-to-one -one salesperson with Canada Post, yes. and we are becoming mechanized. Well, you're not mechanized. from this planet after all. Oh! <laughs> no, actually, we are becoming mechanized that there will be only, except when they're off sick and someone is covering or they're on vacation, you will be having one person going to your house. That's interesting. So, what are you getting so, at, though? So you're saying that the, the Canada Post, because it's got a monopoly, could become a private... You know, I like where you're going with this. I, would I wasn't love to, sales I would before I started. I would love to see Canada Post go private. I really would. Ah, uh, well. I would. Or... You know, because, look, I, I think you could bring a lot of efficiency and cost savings to the model if you were private. There's a lot of things that the private sector would do better than the government. But unfortunately, we need the Post. We, it's, a, it's an imperative service. I still use it. Thank you. Can I quote you? Yes, absolutely. Look, you're the backbone of, of business. We still need mail. We try and do a lot with email, but the truth is we need physical delivery, and it's a core service. That's why you can't go on strike anymore. 
<laughs> we only went on for like a half a day and I got locked out. Hey, listen, if you so, want to be a monopoly, you can't go on strike. It's that easy. And you know what? We didn't. We were locked out. I get it. All right. It. Next but, question. Thank you. <laughs> Good one, though. Thank you. Hi, Diane, Kevin. Um, my name is Sam Finnan. I'm a student uh, going to the University of Toronto. Two questions for you. Firstly, would you ever do business with a family member or somebody who you're a close friend with? No, never. All right, that was short and sweet. That's a um, very, very bad, 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 bad idea. Really? Yes. Okay. You have to separate the emotional ties of friendship from business. You really do. That's absolutely crucial because you'll end up making a lot of bad decisions down the road. Look, I have friends that I do business with, but when 9 o'clock comes in the morning, it's business. Fair enough. I've actually litigated some of my friends in the past, and we're, <laughs> and, and we're still friends. Really? Fair yes, enough. because they understand the difference. But I would not. Look, putting family members, nepotism is a disease in a business. You can always hire a better manager than your uncle, son, brother, cousin. <laughs> What's the other part of your question? My next question is, does the O'Leary Funds offer any summer internships for students? <laughs> you know, we, we, do, we do hire, actually, O'Leary Ventures, which uh, Alex Kenji runs here. He's the, he runs my, my venture business. Hires, we had three or four interns this summer, and they had a really interesting time. Look, you hang with me, crazy stuff happens. Trust mm. me. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Yes, talk to Alex. Hi, my name's Sonia Thomason. I do have two questions. I hope I, there's enough time. Um, I hope I word this correctly. Where can one go with an idea to discuss it? Like, are there creative think tanks? Um, okay, this may sound crazy, but like, I think it would be great if someone invented a way of reading in the bathtub and not having your glasses fog up. Like, I mean, I know, anyway. That but, does sound crazy. <laughs> Do you know of our creative, uh, you know, I don't know uh, if look, you're the right uh, you know, one to ask. I that. always point people to the one, you know, platform I know works, and that's Dragon's Den. I mean, we look at all kinds of crazy ideas because we don't think they're all crazy. So, dragonsden.com, put an application in. The show is going to be back in the seventh season. Every year it gets bigger. Every year there's more ideas. And you know the thing about Dragon's Den now, you should think of it as the American Idol of venture capital because even if you don't get funded, millions of people see your product or service and sales go up if it's already got distribution. So people are coming on that show now just to get exposure. I know, but to get on the show, people generally have to have yeah, something. I mean. You have I to have a prototype or a business plan or yeah. whatever. So, I mean, there are... Aren't you, you know, Miss Negative tonight? <laughs> I'm so mean. I'm the mean one, Kevin. I guess um, I meant, yeah, as you're saying. Yeah, just but if you want to develop to generate ideas, even. yeah, there's lots of resources to do that sort of thing. I mean, they have all those uh, idea labs and uh, in, what do they call them, incubators and so forth. I'm sure if you go online and are looking, you know, business idea development, you can find lots of resources. Even like your local chamber of commerce, I'm sure okay. people can put you in touch with uh, the sort of people that could help you with that. And my other question is more specific. Um, I know on Dragon's Den, a lot of time, your uh, idea is rejected merely on the basis of the valuation is crazy, blah, blah, blah. That's a good and, enough reason to reject it. Of course, I accept that. But um, do you ever follow up with an idea privately, maybe later with the person, because you thought the idea was, itself was good? Does no, that ever if you, happen? If, if, if the person was such an idiot to try and oversell it at a crazy price, I don't want to follow up with them, because I know there's a thousand more deals coming. There's a million okay. deals in the Naked City, and I'm going to see 100 more tomorrow. But you haven't done that, Kevin, but I know some of the other dragons have done that. I think they're crazy. But haven't you gone, like I know Arlene went back and got in business with somebody, and Jim has even called people. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for but, And you've never been part of those never, after the never. den deals. You know, after I say no, they're dead to me. I don't even think about them anymore. Okay. All right. Next question. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I, I noticed uh, that you, you seem to use the word cockroach a lot on your show. Um, so I had a question. I, I heard you on the radio show Q earlier this week, and uh, this, as, there was a question that came up there that came again tonight where you get asked something along the lines of, how do you feel when people, that people seem to see you as very belligerent? No, and I'm you, not and belligerent. And you come, well, yeah, you come back with the answer, but is telling the truth belligerent? That's not really a complete answer because what about the use of the word cockroach? Is there a utility to name calling uh, yes, outside I of the entertainment industry? The reason industry cockroach ratings? works is it sort of depicts 
that business in the pecking order where it stands. So the way I look at it is if I say, look, this I, you're the cockroach of this industry. You're nothing. You, you haven't got any sales yet. These are all facts. And I think it's being a little graphic, but factual. You're a cockroach. What's wrong with that? You're, it, it should be motivational. I think I'm encouraging you. It, 